Welcome. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning to our um, American participants uh, of our Human Rights Academy. Uh, we are really thrilled that so many people decided to join us uh, for this meeting with our very special guest, Professor uh, Adam Bodnar, Commissioner for Human Rights. So welcome everybody. Mm. Our webinar take, takes place within our uh, 15th Humanity in Action Human Rights Academy which is a first ever 100% online edition of it. The Academy is organized uh, thanks to the generous support of the Foundation Remembrance, Responsibility and Future and the support of the US Embassy in Poland. We are very happy that the Commissioner for Human Rights Office rendered uh, the honorary patronage of our, uh, our Academy and we are also very happy that we managed to get several media outlets to become our media patrons. All of these uh, efforts are meant to contribute to our keeping human rights alive by building a network of upstanders. Thank you so much for this opportunity to continue our mission. I'm Monika Mazurafał. I'm president of the Foundation Humanity in Action Poland. And uh, Humanity in Action Poland is a non-governmental organization which specializes in boosting activism by linking history and human rights education, preempting and counteracting hate speech, as well as uh, finding and testing innovative methods and tools. We have built a vibrant network of activists whom we support in their grassroots activities. Teaching human rights and inspiring young people to become active and engaged citizens who care about others and their rights is itself a challenge. Yes, uh, as you might imagine, doing it exclusively online uh, takes this challenge to another level. But we decided to take up this challenge. Why? While the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted probably all of us to some extent, as individuals, or as organizations, as societies, we also quickly noticed that the ones in our societies who are usually facing systemic discrimination and marginalization experienced the impact of this pandemic even more deeply. COVID-19, acted as a sort of x-ray and exposed the already existing deep systemic inequalities as well as acted as a trigger creating new ones that is why the, we found that it is more important than ever to continue with educating on human rights while reflecting on what we have learned from and through this pandemic as a society hoping that we contribute to boosting civic activism in this new normal reality. As the Commissioner uh, for Human Rights in Poland is the constitutional authority for legal control and protection, especially in the field of uh, citizens' rights and freedoms, we are very happy that Professor Bodnar, yet again, accepted our invitation. For our international guests, let, uh, let me especially uh, underline that his activities, uh, uh, that in his activities, the commissioner is integral and independent from all other uh, state authorities. For this session, we decided that we, in the, that we divided our time equally. The first uh, 30 minutes will go, uh, will be devoted to uh, Professor Bodnar input. And the next 30 minutes uh, will be for questions, comments, and dialogue with our participants. So we ask uh, all of you to share your questions in the, in the chat box. And according to the rule, come first, serve first, participants of this webinar will have the chance to contribute. You will be able to ask your question um, on your own. So. Uh, now let's get started and uh, we agreed that uh, uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will ask first uh, uh, three questions to uh, our 
uh, guest. So uh, first, uh, I would suggest that we focus on the condition of, of democracy in Poland in times of COVID-19. And I would like to highlight three uh, most important areas. In Poland, uh, authorities have introduced so-called epidemic threat situation and as a consequence, several restrictions in our daily life and rights and freedoms of citizens were severely limited without a proper legal basis. At the same time, representatives of political uh, elites frequently violated these restrictions, which of course generated indignation of many Poles expressed by public protests, memes, songs, etc. Media informed that some citizens who took part in protests were severely punished with uh, financial fines up to 200, 2,500 uh, euros. Whereas people participating in uh, some other public gatherings were excused from this responsibility. So my question is, has equality of citizens become an empty concept? The last theme, important theme, is, uh, uh, is about uh, the upcoming presidential re re uh, elections. Uh, can Polish society count on fair elections with equal access to all citizens in the COVID-19 environment? So I know these are uh, lots of big questions in our first, first round, but uh, uh, these are the areas where you as a public uh, uh, servant, you, you, you've been extremely busy in the, in the recent time. So the floor is yours. Uh, okay. Professor Bodna. Okay. Thank you, Monika. Thank you for uh, introducing me. Uh, it is my pleasure to be once again with Humanity in Action. It seems to me that I, I think I'm from the first edition, you know, with you during those academies. It's, uh, I, I think I participated in almost all of them, you know, maybe at some point I couldn't because I was traveling. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, congratulations on the, on the development and on this fact that you are uh, still trying, you know, to do your job. Uh, and even, you know, in times of, uh, of COVID, uh, so with use of the online techniques. Uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm missing, to be honest, uh, is uh, emotions, because I remember that all our previous meetings were really highly emotional in terms of substance, in terms of values we are talking about, in terms of, you know, sharing of some of my thoughts and, uh, and ideas and experiences concerning the action, uh, concerning human rights. And, and these days, you know, you do all of this, but simply it's a little bit much more difficult to build emotions, you know, when you are uh, in all different locations and uh, when uh, we are not all together, you know, so really being together builds emotion uh, and without it, uh, you know, we can of course do our job. Uh, we can of course educate ourselves, we can share experiences, but still I think something valuable is, is missing in our life and we really miss this, uh, this element. But referring to your questions, um, uh, I would say it's, it's quite a difficult time for the Polish democracy. I would start with saying this, uh, because, um, you know, those last months were like a direct proof that Poland is not so-called consolidated democracy. There was a report by Freedom House concerning Poland saying that Poland is not consolidated democracy, which was quite, a, quite an important report, because it said that something is wrong, basically, that this whole mechanism is uh, spoiled, that this whole mechanism does not work as it should. Because if it, if it would be good uh, mechanism, uh, then uh, nobody would argue that we are not consolidated. But apparently, because of uh, different reasons, uh, presidential elections uh, that were due to happen on 10th of May have not been organized. It happened for the first time in the Polish history, uh, in the Polish recent history, that elections that were scheduled, that were properly announced, uh, finally have not been organized at all. And even later on, it was quite difficult for authorities to find out the procedure, how to legally declare that elections didn't take place because without this formal acknowledgement, it was impossible to start with some another process. But, but this mere fact is a proof that the democracy is simply not consolidated. And why did it happen? Uh, the reason was because uh, the government the ruling majority didn't want to declare the state of emergency 
uh, and if the state of emergency would have been declared, then uh, authorities would have to postpone presidential elections by at least three months. Uh, exactly uh, under the Polish constitution, you can organize elections not earlier than 90 days after the end of the emergency state. But authorities didn't do it because to a certain extent, uh, it seems, they wanted to take advantage of this kind of uh, political uh, situation they were like in the middle of the pandemic. Because in the, in, the, in the beginning and in the middle of the pandemic, uh, the government presented itself as a kind of a sheriff which is fighting with this bad world with, by uh, securing the uh, people's future, by responding to needs. So it was quite easy to portray the government in positive terms. And also uh, it was much easier for the president to make a real campaign while the other candidates had to stay at home basically, because they couldn't, because of different uh, uh, restrictions, they couldn't travel, they couldn't meet people because everybody was in isolation. But Mr. President, who was running for the second term, who was not obliged to do this, uh, he was not obliged to do this uh, because uh, he was basically performing his function as the, uh, as the president. So, but those elections didn't take place. Uh, and except uh, instead of this, uh, we have uh, another legal regulation uh, so we do not have emergency state, but we have another regulation, which is called the state of pandemic. Uh, and this regulation and this situation has been introduced on the basis of a legislation created uh, in 2008. So like the old date legislation, which was not really frequently used because we didn't have that kind of situation in the Polish recent history, but basically under the, uh, under the, the law, uh, it was possible to create some restrictions on our freedom of movement, uh, on, I don't know, sale of certain goods, on uh, wearing uh, masks in the public places, all those different restrictions um, connected with distancing itself, uh, isolation, uh, restrictions in trade, restrictions in organizing different uh, events uh, in, in public uh, places. So what the government did uh, was uh, creating different ways of restricting our freedoms, but in fact, by use of the simple legislation, by the ordinary legislation, plus, plus, uh, uh, plus the use of uh, different executive ordinances. Uh, so the problem was that some of those regulations uh, that have been introduced by the government didn't have really a sound basis in the legislation because the legislation was rather designed for such, let's say, general situations with some uh, pandemic situation happening in some small regions, not for the whole country. Uh, uh, so uh, I had a feeling and a number of my interventions uh, concerned uh, overreaching uh, or overbroad regulation uh, adopted by authorities. So that is the reason why um, I have claimed from time to time that some of those uh, regulations are uh, basically going too far than the legislation allows. Like the good example is that at certain point, we have a prohibition to enter forests. You know, if you look uh, really strictly into the law, you couldn't find like a legislative provision that would allow for this, for to impose that kind of a restriction. Or for example, uh, we had a regulation saying that mm, uh, uh, teenagers cannot go out uh, from their houses without, uh, accompany, uh, without accompanying uh, parents or without somebody adult with them. Uh, so, so they had to stay basically for a couple of weeks only at home without any possibility to exit home individually. And also you couldn't find like a proper uh, legislative provision for this. At certain point when the whole nation, when the whole society was subject of all those uh, uh, rigorous uh, regulations and restrictions, uh, it appeared that there are some people in Poland who are having, let's say, like, who are more equal than, than other people. Uh, so there were basically three examples like this. One of those examples was when the whole delegation of the government has decided to put flowers uh, on 10th of April uh, at the monument of the victims of catastrophe of a plane crash in Smolensk. And believe me, they didn't keep distance at all 
uh, so they behave like in let's say more or less normal circumstances so it was a little bit like a strange to people you know come on how is it possible you know we, all, uh, all of us are you know taking care about masks uh, we are keeping distance we are not meeting in public places and suddenly you, you see a group of people who are quite close to each other and they are just marching and putting flowers uh, in front of the monument uh, the second situation was even more let's say brutal because on the same date, uh, Jarosław Kaczyński, the president of the ruling party, has decided to visit the grave of his mother. But at that day, uh, at that time, it was impossible for anybody to visit cemeteries. You know, there were even situations where people couldn't really participate even in funerals because of all those sanitary restrictions. And suddenly, one guy uh, who is, let's say, one of the most important persons in Poland, uh, is uh, putting those flowers and uh, is entering uh, with limousines uh, the, um, the cemetery and it does not take uh, about any uh, regulations. Or just recently, uh, there was a situation when the prime minister met some people in a restaurant and without masks, uh, they were just meeting each other, eating something, also ignoring the binding law. So because of this, we had this big debate about, okay, so what does it really mean that we are having equality before uh, the law. But I should add to this one more example, because one of those restrictions concerned freedom of assembly. So uh, by virtue of those regulations, uh, all the assemblies have been banned. Uh, so whenever somebody had tried to organize, uh, uh, to organize any assembly, this person could be subject of some uh, notification or some uh, uh, small crime uh, by, imposed by the, by the police, but also it was possible to notify this person to the uh, sanitary administrative office to impose a harsh financial penalty. And there were some people who were uh, making that kind of demonstrations or some artistic happenings and suddenly it appeared that they had to pay uh, 2,500 euros for uh, just mere participation in that, that kind of an event. While at the same time, you could see that people are just uh, much more relaxed, they are uh, using their freedom already that this whole regime, uh, this whole sanitary regime is much more uh, relaxed and liberalized as, as, it, as it was, let's say, in the end of March and in the beginning of April. So people had a feeling, okay, so does it really mean that if we do anything which is kind of a political, then immediately the law applies? And when we are just doing like a normal relaxed activity, then the law does not apply. So those people who were participating in those demonstrations were saying, yeah, why, are we have to, why do we have to pay those high, harsh penalties just for exercise of our um, freedom of, uh, of assembly? So all of this created a lot of public outreach and a lot of public um, interest. Uh, my office tried to intervene in most of those cases. Uh, with those administrative penalties, we, we've managed to get to the decision when those penalties have been lifted. But in general, you have a feeling that uh, there is a certain group of people uh, which, which are connected or affiliated with the ruling camp, which are immune from any uh, responsibility and who are not even giving example of like a proper behavior, who are ignoring regulations, who are thinking that those regulations are not important to, um, uh, to them. So from the point of view of, of, of values and, uh, and the democratic state, uh, which should be based on the equality before the law, uh, you know, it was really highly detrimental um, uh, situation. And, you know, it may happen that still, you know, we will face that kind of situations in, in future. Um, right now, uh, we are uh, in a, maybe I will not go into like very technical constitutional details concerning the first presidential elections. I will just get to the second presidential elections. So right now we are waiting for uh, the date of uh, elections, which is 28th uh, June. Uh, and those elections would be will be organized uh, via like regular uh, uh, casting votes uh, in electoral posts, uh, but also it will it will be possible to send votes by post. So uh, so to use simply so called correspondence votes. Um, the problem is that those elections are organized in a very strange fashion because uh, on the one hand, under the constitution, these are perfectly new elections. But on the other hand, the parliament has adopted a law saying that if somebody has registered 
his electoral committee in previous elections, then this person may re-register this committee in those new elections, which means that all those previous candidates are uh, able to participate in those elections, but it is possible for, uh, let's say, new candidates to appear. The problem is that new candidates are having, and in fact today is the deadline, we're having only seven days for collecting uh, required amount of signatures. And with such uh, candidates like Rafał Trzaskowski, the current mayor of Warsaw, it was not that difficult uh, because he had uh, really deep organizational structures. Uh, and so he didn't collect just 100,000, but he collected 1,600,000 uh, signatures. But, but what I was trying to say last week in Senate of the Polish Republic is that this law puts uh, to the detriment the situation of other potential candidates. Because, you know, if you imagine like any individual who would just have a dream of being a candidate and just to, you know, maybe, and just to compete with others, this person would not be able uh, successfully, most probably, to collect this 100,000 signatures within seven days, especially in case when all the previous candidates had altogether 45 days to collect those 100,000 uh, signatures. So like you see like the big uh, difference. So this uh, problem of uh, non-equality, in my opinion, is serious uh, because uh, it might be one of the reasons to invalidate elections by the Supreme Court later on. You know, you, you can expect all different uh, possibilities uh, here because basically we, are, uh, we have created a procedure which is completely new and which does not have a really uh, sound basis in the Constitution, to be honest. Uh, of course, uh, what is better, uh, or what is normal, rather, is that this time elections will be organized by the National Electoral Commission, which gives a high level of guarantee that most probably there will be no kind of, a, you know, uh, elements of falsification and, uh, or even, uh, or some miscalculation votes. You know, National Electoral Committee is having a lot of public trust in the Polish society, around 70% uh, of the public trust, so, so it is good. And why we are, you know, and we are happy with this because previous elections, can you imagine, were going to be were uh, organized by the deputy prime minister. Uh, so it was quite a weird situation when you have presidential elections, and the major organ responsible for election uh, for organization of those elections is the deputy prime minister uh, in the government, who obviously has a certain interest in a certain result uh, of um, uh, elections. Uh, of course, still, we, we might have a lot of problems with both uh, securing health uh, protection during uh, elections, because, you know, it is not certain to what extent all sanitary rules will be followed. What about uh, queues um, uh, standing in front of uh, electoral posts? Uh, what about uh, uh, mm, protecting uh, people who are working in those uh, local uh, commissions? You know, it, it creates a danger. It creates danger of transmission of the disease, uh, and especially because right now we didn't st stop yet the epidemic. We still have uh, quite many uh, cases, maybe not that many as, uh, as in such case countries like uh, Spain, uh, UK, or France, but still the number of infections is still relatively high in Poland. So, you know, so there is a risk that, it, that the whole elections may produce uh, increase in, uh, in number of infected persons. Uh, there is also a second risk. Uh, what about casting individual votes? I can imagine that uh, there might be a certain group of people who would be deprived of the real possibility of casting votes, especially those who are residing abroad. Um, there are some procedures for them to cast a vote, but it seems to me that they are quite burdensome and that they would not be effective enough uh, to uh, give every Polish citizen residing abroad uh, to cast a vote. And finally, uh, it is also prob probable under the law that the Minister of Health may decide that some regions of Poland are cut off from the possibility to cast votes uh, in local electoral commissions. So the question is, how many and which uh, regions or cities will be regarded as the Minister of Health as required to be, let's say, cut off from casting votes in local uh, electoral uh, commissions because uh, this decision might have impact on the uh, on the turnout um, uh, of elections because most probably uh, votes uh, collected uh, with the use of just 
uh, of the post, and so uh, I mean those all correspondent votes uh, will not be enough to uh, will not be at the same level as uh, number of votes casted in local electoral uh, commissions. So number of problems, and and uh, you know we wait for the, the for the development. But for me, what we are experiencing now is not having a sound basis in the constitution. It is a result of something like a political compromise between different parties. And because it is a compromise, uh, it is also probable, or maybe not, it is also possible that this whole uh, scheme might be at certain point overturned by some of the political uh, actors, especially by the ruling party. So basically this risk is somewhere uh, in the air. But still, you know, people uh, do prefer and people tend to believe that everything will be okay. Maybe it will be like this. Maybe, you know, maybe my warnings uh, should not be regarded too seriously uh, because we are in the middle of campaign and it seems to me that maybe everything will go fine but you never know you know in Polish politics things may change uh, dramatically over the night and uh, and then you are uh, waking up in a new reality uh, and you know two days later everybody is trying to um, to argue that oh come on you know yes it's obvious that things have changed and we are uh, like implementing different political scenarios but, but it means simply that we are not a stable democracy. And in addition to all of this, of course, you know, what counts here is that we have a serious problem with the rule of law, with independence of judiciary, with pressure by the European Union to implement uh, judgments of the Court of Justice. But it is just one another uh, deep story, you know, requiring additional 20 minutes to explain. But believe me that with judiciary and with rule of law, you know, the problem is equally uh, uh, important and equally uh, uh, visible. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, concerns and uh, legal concerns. Uh, I have another uh, big area, uh, rights of minorities and marginalized groups uh, on my agenda. So uh, could you please share with us uh, what are the key pro problems uh, uh, with uh, some groups like, for example, people with disabilities or people in general public uh, uh, care facilities like uh, Roma communities, LGBTQIA uh, persons, uh, migrants or refugees. Uh, uh, why the situation of victims of domestic violence has been reported to be especially difficult. Uh, uh, another point is uh, online education uh, has proved uh, economic barriers when some families cannot afford to provide children with uh, the necessary equipment and internet access. Uh, finally, what institutional gaps have been exposed during the pandemic and uh, what does it tell us about the condition of a state? Of course, it's not possible for you to respond to all the areas. Uh, I'm pretty aware of that, but uh, I'm just highlighting what are the issues of our key concerns. Mm -hmm. So the floor is yours. Uh, well, uh, uh, please uh, mm -hmm. share your, your insight. I think that this whole situation with pandemic, as in every country, was something like a check for authorities. So to what extent the system is working uh, properly and to what extent system is securing rights of the people uh, by all different means uh, and you know I have mixed feelings to be honest uh, because on the one hand uh, uh, I have noticed a number of elements of the operation of the states which simply didn't work or didn't work sufficiently but on the other hand uh, uh, some elements worked properly and uh, uh, and we are able to to continue just you know let's take the online education. To be honest, Polish school was totally not prepared for online education, not at all. But somehow, and it is even confirmed by scholars, in majority of cases, pupils and teachers uh, somehow took the responsibility and they have managed to switch from like, a real, uh, from like the daily education to online education within a couple of days. Uh, even in some small cities, you know, it was not such a, you know, I don't claim that the quality was like exceptionally high, that in all situation uh, everything was was great. But somehow, you know, this kind of, kind of a mental crossing has been made, uh, and they were able to uh, to make this uh, teaching. Uh, and there was a good study on this by Professor Jacek Pyzalski from Poznan University. 
But on the other hand, of course, you know, we experienced that uh, in a number of families, uh, there was a problem with equipment. So you could see that some groups have been excluded. Uh, for sure, uh, there was a problem with uh, educational capability of teachers to educate uh, via internet. Uh, so, so it had impact on the, on the um, quality. But also, you know, we had even such a case that, uh, can you imagine, some children gone missing because of the system. So in Warsaw, it appeared after a couple of weeks that there are more than 600 children in whole Warsaw which are just missing. You know, nobody knows what is going on with them. So the, because they didn't connect to, let's say, Microsoft Teams or to Zoom or whatever, uh, and uh, school didn't have enough, um, uh, let's say, technical capabilities to check what is going on with them. So uh, because that kind of a checking would require cooperation with the police, and police at that time was overwhelmed with controlling all those sanitary requirements. So, uh, so you know, you can imagine all different things that happen with these uh, children, including, you know, not only poverty, but maybe also domestic violence uh, or different emotional distress um, uh, situations. Uh, another problem is, uh, of course, domestic violence because uh, uh, Polish system maybe is not particularly good. Uh, but, you know, when, in case you are uh, closed at home, you know, then this prob problem increases. And I didn't see like a big involvement of Polish authorities in terms of promoting some attitudes uh, uh, or shaping some like vision, you know, how we should help potential victims. Uh, I remember that in London, for example, there was a speech by mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, about this issue, just particularly uh, this issue in Poland, you know, forget about Polish authorities talking openly that uh, about need to fight against domestic violence, you know, rather they would try to escape uh, uh, this, uh, this topic. Uh, yet another problem is the situation in different closed uh, places. Uh, like prisons, uh, social foster homes, and uh, and other places. And uh, uh, I see here that with us uh, is, is my colleague from my office, Michał Żłobecki, Żłobicki. So maybe I will uh, uh, say about uh, one practice we have developed, uh, because we also had a problem, you know, how to monitor prisons in case they are closed and they are not admitting anybody from outside the world. And we invented, uh, maybe not invented, but we basically, uh, uh, really implemented a certain recommendation that maybe we should make monitoring via Skype. So basically it works this way that we are um, uh, asking the prison officials that we would like to talk over Skype for, with the list of, let's say, 25 prisoners, like ra uh, selected randomly or according to some criteria. And believe me that after talking to those, let's say, 25 prisoners, you really have a knowledge what is going on inside. So what are problems and when authorities are not uh, meeting uh, expectation, especially if it is on your side, the selection of people you want to talk. Uh, so, but the, the biggest problem we had were social foster homes. Uh, so social foster homes were not prepared. And in my opinion, it's not just a question of some mistakes made by authorities, uh, but simply a systemic mistake uh, concerning uh, lack of provision of uh, sufficient health uh, mm, protection measures to institutions that are part of so-called social care. So like the lack of this interaction between social care and health systems was one of the reasons why we had problems with, uh, with social um, uh, foster homes. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, mm, you know, right now we are having a big crisis in Silesia, so which is yet another a problem maybe of non-efficiency of the Polish uh, of the Polish services, but basically uh, this whole situation proved to indicate that uh, uh, this consequence for human rights is not just like a single one. Okay, I remember that. Uh, I'm, for example, I remember that when people in Warsaw, let's say, like kind of a let's say Warsaw bubble, was heavily interested in the uh, closure of forests. Uh, as, a, as a priority issue for them, because, you know, they couldn't exercise jogging, they couldn't make walking, they couldn't, uh, I don't know, go, uh, uh, they couldn't make bicycle, uh, they couldn't uh, ride on, uh, on, on bicycle, all those different restrictions. At the same time, I had like numerous other problems concerning other uh, situations that were 
um, that concerned persons with disabilities, uh, persons in different closed institutions, uh, homeless persons. Uh, we deal with uh, abuse of power by uh, secret services in terms of using surveillance uh, powers with this abuse of powers by the police, all different other uh, um, problems. Um, but but I do uh, well, also one additional thing I would like to say what worked is the operation of the administration. In my opinion, we tend to uh, complain on the quality of the administration, but in fact, the whole administration started almost day by day to work online. Uh, of course, with the exception maybe of some underfunded institutions, like the, for example, sanitary uh, administration, or uh, I don't know, building uh, supervision uh, agency. But most of the ministries, uh, regional offices started to work online, and it proved to be quite uh, effective, you know, in terms of resolving problems, contacting offices, uh, uh, exchanging documents, exchanging correspondence. So I think that uh, one of the good things I would say is that after this period, uh, let's hope, you know, it will finish soon, we'll be much more skilled uh, to, to do proper cooperation with uh, uh, administration, but also to consult each other to make all those different online seminars. But also, I think the administration, uh, to great extent, proved that it may work online and it could be also efficient. Uh, and you know, we are not Estonia. Estonia is the leader in the world in this regard. Uh, we are a few few years behind uh, Estonia, but still we are able to uh, to do it. Thank you so much. And the last question, uh, would, I would like to refer to your most recent book, uh, Obywatel, Citizen, uh, in which you encourage political, political parties and uh, political movements to build networks of people who could intellectually support them and uh, democracy in Poland in general. So uh, Humanity in Action is a community of engaged young uh, professionals and activists uh, that values intergenerational learning. So. If you were to offer them uh, some advice, uh, what are the tangible steps uh, they could take or start, uh, start by, by, by what? Uh, in order to contribute to transforming Poland into a country with more dialogue, respect, justice and solidarity. So based on your expertise with many initiatives that your office was supporting, what strategies work? What could young people do or uh, is there maybe just one thing everybody could do to start making some difference uh, in the world? I think um, the, in this book you, you mentioned, uh, you know, I try to argue that uh, freedom is in us, that it, it depends on us whether we take advantage of those rights we are having. Freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, access to public information, right to petition, but also right to uh, request some activism mm, or some uh, mm, proper work from our representatives in uh, parliament or in other representative uh, offices. And the question is to what extent we, uh, we are just waiting that somebody will do something or to what extent we are putting real pressure uh, on, certain, uh, on certain issues. Uh, that is the first point. Second point is that uh, what works uh, is uh, creativity. That uh, if you try to uh, follow the same steps all the time, like you know, yet another petition signed by 1,000 people uh, and then nobody is reading this petition, and you spend a lot of time on collecting those votes but basically didn't work, uh, then maybe uh, it is not the, the way to do things. You know, that we, we must be really creative in terms of uh, pushing our agenda in terms of finding new ways to get to the people in order to increase attention to our uh, topics. Like the good example, uh, in my opinion, one of the most uh, efficient examples of that kind of activism is uh, Mr. Bart Staszewski, who is the LGBT activist, who decided to, to make something like the artistic action uh, about so-called uh, LGBT free zones. Uh, so we had like a series of resolutions adopted at the local level by local communities, they declared themselves that they will be uh, zones uh, free from the LGBT ideology. Uh, you know, we have a big problem with this discussion on LGBT rights uh, these days. Uh, 
but uh, but in this context uh, but in this context uh, it was really i think painful to to many people and bart staszewski has decided to create such an artistic installation that he went physically to each and every of those local communities and next to the signpost of the given city he put another signpost saying lgbt free zone he just made a photo maybe in some of those locations he found like real uh, persons who feel like affected and then he started to promote those pictures uh, or in the web uh, so suddenly this topic became very visible uh, in the in poland and in the international uh, discussion circles uh, european union started to intervene council of europe started to be interested number of uh, number of uh, member states of the european union and politicians started to ask questions so what was the point just creativity of presenting the problem you know nothing else he could write another petition you know that he's against those zones but nobody would would care uh, i think it is important also to remember that uh, we cannot uh, perform our uh, the democracy cannot work if we do not protect institutions uh, it is one of the so-called lessons by timothy snyder but i really uh, do believe in this that we have to take care about freedom of speech uh, we have to be, uh, defend uh, all those independent institutions that, you, that are controlling the protection of our rights. But for example, like with freedom of speech, it's not just about uh, protesting uh, against some violations of rights of some journalists, but just, you know, ask your friends whether they are making a paid subscription of some press titles, okay? Whether they are just reading the content which is just publicly available or whether they are just contributing you know the same amount as let's say two coffees in starbucks per month uh, in order to subscribe this or the other press title you know without those subscriptions those newspapers would not be able to to work uh, especially uh, if they are really independent because if they are independent then they have problems with corporations they have problems with government they have problems with in poland especially with state-owned companies that would not give them any commercials and so and so on and uh, and it is important for us because we need to have those intermediaries but also you know we can also be those intermediaries by making our own media in internet uh, but also by making our own uh, ngos and uh, it seems to me that all the activists uh, of uh, hia uh, are people like this you know that they are that you are activists and you know how to do things and you know how to uh, how to educate about different things what I'm missing uh, still, in fact, in Poland is the uh, are really deep actions concerning civic education. You know, I think uh, we have some actions concerning this happening from time to time, uh, but not something that would be really comprehensive and that would go really uh, down to the uh, to small uh, cities. It is uh, of extreme importance to to talk like re in real terms about what is happening uh, in Poland, how to interpret different uh, situations, how to interpret constitution. Uh, and uh, I still dream about like massive uh, civic educational programs in, uh, in Poland. But, but each of us could be such an educator, you know, each of us may uh, start that kind of um, uh, work and just explain to others uh, in local community or broader uh, some aspects of the operation of the state of the European Union of international cooperation or maybe of some economic uh, issues um, I, I think it, 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 it is important just not to close yourself uh, but just to try to seek uh, any opportunity to be with others and to convince them uh, about democratic and liberal uh, values in the society Thank you very much for uh, sharing your uh, uh, ideas. And now let's open up our discussion for the public. I have uh, uh, more or less uh, seven, eight questions. Uh, uh, the first person is Asha. Asha, uh, could you please ask your question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so first, I would like to thank you very much for the informative uh, speech and remarks. And um, in terms of my question, during this situ situation of a global pandemic, we have seen many governments take advantage of the situation. And hence, my question concerns the future. So taking into account that situations of such national emergency can happen again, uh, a second wave of the coronavirus is predicted by some. 
what can be done to prevent abuse of law and position to take place? Hmm. Uh, I think, you know, the only uh, weapon we have in our hands is uh, our, uh, is our power as citizens, power to protest and power to raise concern when some procedures are abused. Uh, you know, my feeling is that I, I cannot guarantee, uh, I cannot, uh, I would say it this way, I will not exclude a situation that this government will introduce uh, emergency state within two weeks. Why not? You know, if they say that because of some reasons, you know, uh, the pandemic is still high, uh, let's introduce state of emergency now. Uh, of course, uh, most probably that kind of a decision would be made just to achieve certain political purposes. But you know, it is possible. You know, it is. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, you cannot. You cannot exclude uh, this. Let's hope it will not happen. But but I do. Uh, but what I'm afraid is the consequence of the pandemic for all different future regulations. You know, let's imagine that uh, the government uh, wants to introduce some new measures uh, affecting our privacy. Uh, some new surveillance measure, you know, just making argument, oh, it is because of COVID and we have to prevent ourselves from COVID would be just the same argument as the argument after 9-11, oh, it is because of terrorism, you have, we have to uh, protect ourselves. So it will create like a, uh, like a grant for really, for different regulations restricting our uh, freedoms. Uh, the only possibility is to strengthen civil society, is to strengthen uh, mm, political discourse, pluralism in the debate, and also to strengthen different watchdog uh, uh, organizations and independent media, and via this uh, to put a stop uh, when that kind of ideas uh, appear. You know, there is no other uh, possibility in my opinion. Thank you. The next person would be Mr. Grzegorz Kujawinski. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to ask about the situation of the asylum seekers uh, who were approaching uh, Poland during the uh, pandemic. Uh, when I read the official bill of the Internal uh, Affairs Ministry from 13th of March, there was a list of uh, people who can actually cross the border and there was no asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, uh, can, uh, can the uh, pandemic be a, an excuse to break the uh, 51 convention for the refugee status and can it be also a danger for the future uh, in case we have uh, influx of, uh, of refugees uh, asylum seekers coming to Poland uh, to break this law of uh, non recruitment uh, because of uh, health issues maybe not necessarily epidemics but maybe some other mm -hmm. yeah. I can only say that you're right uh, in my opinion, uh, this whole regime that was introduced was the direct uh, break of the uh, Refugee Convention uh, and non refoulement uh, provision. Uh, we submitted a couple of letters to the bodyguard and to the Ministry of Interior, but simply, uh, you know, they were answering in a way just kind of avoiding to, uh, to, to really refer to this issue. Uh, and uh, and but but to, to be honest, they didn't uh, uh, they didn't uh, deny uh, that the refugee convention has been broken. So and in fact, you know, we are still living in this in the same situation. You know that, uh, as far as I understand, I think that those regulations still are valid in this regard. So you know, so uh, but you reminded me that we should come back once again. You know, to to write to the. Uh, to the ministry and to the bodyguard, uh, because uh, uh, maybe you know it is time you know to fight for uh, re retrieval of those uh, of those rights. But uh, please note also that Poland, uh, when the state of uh, when the pandemic uh, occurred, didn't make any der derogations to international agreements. So there was no uh, derogation, for example, to the European Convention on Human Rights nor to, uh, to, to any other international uh, instruments. But, but it was a situation when uh, I think everybody was, uh, was so much overwhelmed with fighting with the COVID that that kind of issues uh, escaped the public attention. You know, it didn't escape my attention, but, but in general, it was difficult to convince anybody to, 
to 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 say some more serious words about uh, about this. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question interconnected uh, regarding migrant situation. So I would ask uh, Natalia and Victor to ask the question on migrants. Uh, that was actually me. Sorry for not changing the nick. Anyway, uh, I wanted to ask you if you know anything about any kind of systemic kind of source of information about migrant situation currently. Because I know that there are many researchers uh, being done currently on that and uh, many scientists are, especially so, um, social scientists are researching a migrant situation, but does the state, uh, Polish state, even like tries to monitor what's happening with the migrants um, in Poland during the pandemics? Mm. To be honest, you know, we try to monitor as much as we can because we are in contact with major organizations and major groups. Uh, recently, we were informed about COVID in one of the uh, uh, centers for migrants. Uh, so we are, we are trying to control the situation there. Uh, but, uh, but in general, you know, please note that in Poland, uh, uh, we are living in a very difficult uh, situation concerning, in general, discussion about migrants. It is a little bit like a mixture of... Uh, uh, of uh, the policy uh, under which the Polish government does not want to accept any migrants, like in official documents, especially in relationship with the European Union. But on the other hand, Polish government is creating something like the silent acknowledgement that migrants in fact are coming to Poland and are staying and are working here, um, uh, especially from, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, moreover, Polish, uh, before COVID, Polish economy would collapse, in my opinion, if not the work of migrants, because they were really, uh, uh, there were uh, hundreds of them, uh, thousands, sorry, thousands uh, working in uh, agriculture, building, or, uh, uh, or uh, productive uh, industries. Uh, so, uh, why the government is afraid? Uh, because, so, the consequence of this situation is that until today, we do not have any uh, official document that could be entitled migration policy. So we do not have an official migration policy of the Polish state. And it seems to me that right now everything is dependent on the political process. So the government does not want to raise this issue because the, uh, the, the issue of uh, refugees and migration is used uh, instrumentally for uh, political purposes. Uh, as a consequence of the 2015 crisis uh, that we had. So that's why we had this policy of that kind of a silent uh, uh, approval that, you know, that migrants are in fact coming to, uh, to Poland. Thank you. Uh, change of topic, uh, Caroline, uh, could you ask your question, please? Uh, yes, so I was reminded of the blue bucket protests in Russia. Um, a few years back and thinking about how people protest when there is a high cost to protesting openly in the street, as we usually think. Um, so I was wondering how you view the role of those kind of subversive, symbolic type protests when openly protesting becomes increasingly difficult with threats of fines and um, jailing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, that is what I would name under this umbrella creativity, you know, because this creativity should be also about protests. And to be honest, you know, there were uh, some protests, you know, when there was a total ban on uh, demonstrations. Uh, for example, there was an important protest of women uh, protesting against the discussion on the uh, new abortion law that was going to uh, create some additional restrictions on, uh, on abortion. So they did it this way that they created like a very long queue and that every woman was like standing two meters from each other, okay? Uh, so, so there were some that kind of uh, initiatives. Uh, there, were also, uh, there was also one interesting uh, artistic happening uh, that uh, when those elections didn't take place, uh, the group of artists created such a uh, artistic um, uh, action, which referred to, in fact, 70s in Poland, to a very famous artistic uh, action by Cantor. Uh, and it was interesting because they were carrying a letter from the post office to the parliament, but this letter was 14 meters long and three meters high. Uh, 
so there were like a couple of people like marching together and carrying, you know, this fir uh, fir uh, 14 meters long letter. And, but in fact, they were spotted by the uh, police uh, and the police imposed penalties on them. Uh, later on, it was possible to annul those penalties. You know, it was uh, in, in, to a certain extent thanks to, to my intervention. Uh, but, but, it, but it seems to me that people tend to be creative, you know, that, that they, they understand that it is their role these days, you know, just to uh, find a way uh, of uh, protesting, but also find a way uh, how to make those things in internet, you know, how to be uh, creative in, uh, in internet. Uh, and, you know, that is, in my opinion, that is the future, you know, uh, as long as the government will uh, go into more uh, uh, illiberal uh, directions, then uh, this need of that kind of protests will increase. Thank you. Uh, La Mesa? Yeah, hi. Thank you um, again for your time. Um, and expertise. I wanted to ask um, kind of about like your perceptions of your role, which some may consider to be very in the system. So how do you like navigate challenging systems that you are also a part of? Um, who do you like see yourself accountable to? And how do you um, collaborate with activists? Um. You are right that I'm in the system uh, because uh, I'm the part of the state administration, let's say, I'm the civil servant, uh, but I'm also the constitutional organ, constitutional institution, which has a very, uh, very, very mm, uh, strong uh, constitutional regulation and also strong uh, measures of independence and impartiality. So I'm only accountable to the parliament, which means that I have to produce report every year to the parliament and then to present this report and to a certain extent defend values and thesis that are in this report. And, you know, I, uh, I do it regularly. So uh, it's quite sometimes painful experience when you have to answer many difficult questions, but you know, that's what you should do. Uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, like being uh, uh, in the system, I treat myself as uh, understanding that my basic role is to help people and to prove that I'm, uh, that people need me. So like in the context of, for example, pandemic, over uh, those three months, we have produced more than 100 general recommendations, statements. So basically within three months, we did something what we do, do usually within half a year. Okay, just concerning this topic. So really, we worked hard, very, very hard. We, we made hun hundreds of uh, individual interventions. We are active in this protest concerning presidential elections. But our value is reference to law. So we really try to refer to legal arguments on a daily basis and be really strong on those legal arguments and also on the use of our powers, our competences we have in fighting for rights. The second point is that uh, I try to cooperate strongly with NGOs. Uh, in fact, I was elected to a great extent thanks to uh, the support of NGOs. Uh, and I'm, I'm still in contact with them. Uh, and uh, uh, so it seems to me that they constitute really like, uh, uh, like my method of accountability, you know, so how they look at me uh, and how they perceive my work. But of course, it does not mean that I do everything what they would like from me to do because you know, it would be quite uh, uh, difficult to, to follow all, uh, or, not orders, but uh, expectations, okay? You, you must have your own vision of, uh, of things. Uh, and, uh, and also I think, think information policy is important, you know, just to be really transparent, just to uh, try to, do, uh, and be really active in, uh, in daily response. You know, sometimes it is so even painful, you know, this daily response that people are, you know, like expecting from you that within half a day you will make some intervention. Sometimes, you know, you, you have so many different things to, to do that you are not able and people are that dissatisfied when you are not intervening just immediately to some uh, situations. But, you know, you must really feel the pulse of the country, in my opinion, in order to, uh, to, to get what is, what, is going, uh, what is going on. 
Thank you. We are slowly running out of time, but uh, I was wondering whether you uh, uh, you would be uh, so kind and stay with us like five uh, minutes more to, to take. Uh, yeah. two. I, I, I have just five minutes more. Yeah, so, sorry for this, but you know that that's that's how it looks. Uh, that that. Yeah. That's, Thank you so uh, much. Just you know, when we are talking, I I just realized that I have four calls to make just after you know. So <laughs> uh, so and then there is another meeting and another. Yeah. So so let's let's take just. Uh, additional five minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Julia, you are the next person. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the floor. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all our questions and for your speech. So my question would be the following. Uh, what have been the measures taken under so-called anti-xenophobic document that you signed in Warsaw last year with the Ukrainian Ombudsman Denisova? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, once again, I didn't get, I didn't get, once again, if, if, if you can. Um, what have been some measures taken under the anti-xenophobic, as media presents, document you signed last year with the Ukrainian ombudsman Denisova ah, okay, on okay. the relationship of Ukrainians and Poland? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we tend to work on different cases of hate speech concerning migrants in, in Poland. Uh, and, uh, and basically this uh, cooperation was quite important for us. Uh, because it uh, it proved that uh, it is not just an issue of Polish authorities, but that also uh, our partners, our neighbors are watching on our hate speech policies. And uh, it seems to me that Polish government recently is much more active in uh, pursuing that kind of cases, also in prosecutors, uh, prosecuting perpetrators. Uh, so, uh, and uh, um, I wouldn't say that everything is, is, is perfect. It is even far from being perfect. Uh, but uh, but that this document helped me uh, a little bit in, in showing that the problem is much bigger than just uh, my concern about this situation. Um, but I, uh, what I regret, because there was another plan with uh, uh, Mrs. Denisova, that she would come one day uh, in order to visit different regional governor's offices together with me. So these are those offices where Ukrainian workers are wait, waiting for work permits and for uh, different uh, and for visas uh, and for other documents and simply those regional governors offices in Poland are so much under equipped and are of uh, and there are so long queues that I hope that maybe thanks to her involvement we would be able to kind of uh, uh, put spotlight on on this issue but then the pandemic happened so we didn't manage to, to do it and and right now the situation is much more different because some of the Ukrainian workers came back to their country some of them stayed, uh, and uh, and I, I think it is quite difficult yet to estimate to what extent the problem still uh, exists. It seems to me that it exists, but but I but maybe I will still manage to to do, do something with this until the end of my term. Mm -hmm. So the very last question of Malvina. Okay, Malvina. First of all. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, for your speech. Um, oh yes, I am here. Okay, thank you so much for your speech. Uh, it was really inspiring. I wanted to ask what are the legal ways to prevent the the situation right now? Like, what can the person like do? Um, like, <laughs> I wanted to ask um, if the Radbrooks formula is um, applicable in this sense, like if we can just say no to the regulations that uh, are introduced right now, or if we should just wait for the change of the government, what is the right way to, to handle this situation? Thank you. Uh, in my opinion, uh, we have to wait and we have to uh, be active in the political sphere because in my opinion, uh, still the system has not been closed yet. There are a lot of abuses. There are a lot of uh, there is a lot of pressure towards some kind of a, uh, authoritarian liberal system, but it didn't happen yet because we still have independent senate controlled by the opposition. We have a very serious re representation of opposition in the lower chamber. We have a serious, uh, quite pluralistic, still public debate uh, because some of the media uh, are very much. Uh, uh, working in compliance with uh, freedom of speech standards. Uh, although, of course, the pressure by public media on restricting freedom is uh, really high. 
uh, we have uh, very strong local self-governments uh, who are very much independent from the government in terms of political language, but also in terms of their composition and the way they work, and also competences. Uh, you have also, you know, a lot of independent institutions like, you know, uh, bar association, like NGOs, like, uh, mm, uh, like, uh, you know, maybe even some state agencies. For example, right now I cannot say what is the status of the Supreme Chamber of Control, whether Supreme Chamber of Control is subject of being subordinated or not. Okay. So you have all those different, uh, and of course courts. Uh, courts are also, in my opinion, somewhere in the middle of the way towards subordination. Uh, the, the, the work has not been finished in terms of subordination. So when you have all of those, those problems, all of those problems, if there is a political change, in my opinion, it will be rather about repairing the system, holding people accountable, but, uh, but basically it will take, in my opinion, at least 10 years in order to repair the system, okay? In order to uh, come back to the uh, typical rule of law uh, country, it will, be, it will require, in fact, your generation to, to do it, okay? Uh, so, uh, so that is the problem because uh, we have really uh, created a, a huge damage to the legal system and to the way how the state operated. But, base, but on the other hand, maybe the system was not uh, mature enough that this damage was possible uh, uh, to be made. You know, maybe uh, we, uh, we required as the country something like a stress test in order to re-educate ourselves, in order to bring uh, to higher level our understanding of rights. Uh, of our um, understanding of the constitution and also our virtues as uh, citizens. Maybe that is like a, just a painful, like a really, really painful lesson for uh, uh, all of us. I do believe that we'll get out of this lesson uh, and we'll come back to the, uh, to the normal, regular rule of law uh, situation. We'll be back just one of the regular member states of the European Union. Uh, but you know, but it requires time, you know, and it will not happen just overnight with one elections, uh, with just uh, some, you know, one political shift. No, it's it's much bigger process in my. Okay, thank you very much for taking all thank the questions. You. We appreciate that you made the time, that you shared all your expertise. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, and you know, good luck with your school, and you know, uh, really. Thank you very much for inviting. We, inform, we will hope, inform you about the results. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, let's hope next time you know we'll meet physically you know somewhere in Warsaw, uh, not uh, just uh, on the screen of a computer. Okay. Yes, indeed. Yes. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.